is Tyler, and welcome to another episode of Context for Kids, where I teach you guys stuff most adults don't even know. This is your first time hearing, or if you've missed anything, you can find all the episodes archived at contextforkids.podbean.com, which has them downloadable, or at contextforkids.com, where I have transcript for readers, or on my Context for Kids YouTube channel. Parents, all scripture this week comes from the CSB, which is the Christian Standard Bible. You know, it reads a lot better than the ESB for kids, so I made the switch after my friend Matt Knapper, who's getting his PhD in Old Testament studies and is very smart, told me about it. Just don't tell him that I told you he was smart. He'll, he'll never, he'll never come down off of that. Anyway. One of the big questions that philosophers have de debated since just about forever is, are humans basically good or bad? And today we're going to talk about that because it's important before we get to the flood. First of all, let's answer some questions. What the heck is a philosopher? Well, a philosopher is someone who lives and thinks in a certain way, and that certain way is called a philosophy. What is a philosophy? Well, a philosophy is a certain way of looking at things. Depending on our way of looking at things, our philosophy will believe different things about life and death and good and bad and what is real and what is fake. And all that was probably just about as clear as mud. And that's okay. I just want you to remember that our philosophy, which is our beliefs or outlooks, are why we believe this and don't believe that, or do this, but don't do that. When people look at things in the same way, we say that they share the same philosophy. For example, you and I believe in God and in Jesus as our Savior, and we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and that the Holy Spirit instructs us and changes us to become more and more like God in the way we think and behave. And that right there, it affects absolutely everything in our lives. When I answer questions about the meaning of life, or about what's right and wrong, or about what happens to us when we die, my beliefs are based on what I see in the Bible. But just because peop different people base their beliefs about what's written in the Bible, that doesn't mean they're going to agree on everything. And the reason is because God uses the Bible to communicate things to us that we just can't entirely understand because we can't know all the things that he knows and understand things the way he does. Like I always say, our brains are just too small. And it doesn't matter if you're in preschool or Albert Einstein or Stephen Hawking. Everyone is just clueless compared to God. So in the Bible, he spends a lot of time and effort giving us ways to think about things. But sometimes the absolute answers are beyond our ability to understand. As a matter of fact, probably always. Now, believe me, the sooner you accept that, the better. I spend my life wanting to understand God better. I study the Bible every single day, but I will never know and understand everything because, that's right, my brain is too small. But it doesn't bother me. I don't have to worry about it because if I really need to understand something, then it will be either clearly spelled out for me or God will teach it to me over time. As for the rest, only God really needs to understand all of that. What we need is to be able to trust him. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we have to understand weird things in order to be saved or acceptable to God. God doesn't care if I fully understand things like justification and sanctification or Ezekiel's wheels or the book of Revelation. What we need is to be loyal to him by accepting Jesus as his Messiah our Savior, His one unique Son. I don't want you to spend time worrying about anything else right now. But, like I said before, the Bible guides the philosophy 
or the way of thinking and believing and seeing the world of every Christian. We believe there's a God. Not everyone believes that. Some people even believe in thousands of gods. Others practice black magic. Some people believe that their lives are controlled by demons who have to be kept happy or else bad things will happen. All those beliefs are different kinds of philosophies because they control how people think about every part of their lives. Because we're Christians, we believe that we'll rise from the dead and that we'll live together in the world to come with Jesus as our king. We believe that we have the job of making sure that everyone knows about Jesus and salvation. We believe that we should worship Yahweh, the God of the Bible, which and that that's replaced by the title Lord in the Old Testament, and not Allah or Zeus or Marduk or Horus or SpongeBob or whoever. We believe in things like baptism and going to church and all sorts of things. That's our philosophy, and it affects how we treat one another and what we hope for and what we expect and what we accept as true and false and good and bad. Everyone has a philosophy. This morning on the treadmill, I was watching a show about someone whose philosophy is all about winning in sports. All he does is watch sports and coach sports and try to win. That's what he cares about. So that's a philosophy too, and it makes him care about winning and hate losing. Makes him feel great about his life when he wins and like a complete failure in life when he loses. Do you have any philosophies in your life outside the Bible? You probably do. Most people do. And just as long as they don't conflict with the Bible, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Artists, for example, have a philosophy of seeing beauty in the world that's different from others. Exercise and health are important to others, and that has a lot to do with how they look at the world in general. You get the picture. You might talk with your family about their philosophies, or maybe you can play a game of guessing what is important to the people you love and talk about how that affects what they say and do and believe, and they can do the same for you. But here on this program, we talk about the philosophy of the Bible. Even though I have other interests, they don't guide my life in the way I think and my decisions, you know, the same way the Bible does. So to answer the question of, are people basically good or bad, we don't have to go to famous philosophers like Plato or Socrates or Demogenes or any of them, even though they were very smart and amazing thinkers and can really get us thinking deep thoughts too. We go to the Bible first to see what God has to say about the subject. So did God have an answer to this question? You betcha he did. Let's look right now, but brace yourself. It's pretty awful. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. And we're going to skip verse 4 and go to verse 5. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Whoa, dang. Let's stop right there. This isn't really sounding like God thinks that humans are basically good or that we start off good. Sounds like he thinks we are the opposite of good. Bad, and not just bad, but wicked. Wicked all the time. And you might think, oh, well, that was just before the flood. After God starts all over again with Noah, it's going to be different. But let's look and see if that's true. Genesis 8, 21. Yahweh says, I will never curse the ground because of human beings, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I've done. So evidently, the situation hadn't changed. Dang, guys. But what about maybe the prophets? What did they have to say? Let's try Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? I think I need a new book to read because this one is making us look really bad there, guys. Can we do that? Can we get a second opinion? 
Because all the stuff in the Bible says we're pretty much awful and gross. Jeremiah says that not only are we liars deep down in our hearts, which means in our thoughts and our minds, but there's no cure. Ah! Was Jeremiah right? Are we hopeless with no cure available? Well, he's right, but he never said that there would never be a cure. He just said there wasn't a cure when he was alive. I want you to remember that God doesn't believe in hopeless situations. He's always got a plan. And we will talk about that later. And before any of y'all go on saying, well, that explains my brothers and sisters, just understand they're thinking the exact same thing about you. There's only one exception ever to the whole wicked thinking situation. It isn't you, and it sure as heck isn't me. And it isn't even your mom or dad or grandparents or your pastor. It's Jesus. The rest of us start out life as a complete mess, and sometimes it gets better, and sometimes it gets worse, but it never gets entirely fixed. We can be pretty obnoxious, and the sooner we stop pretending otherwise, the sooner that God can start changing us from the inside out. But that's all in the future here in Genesis, and there's no hope during the time of Noah. God doesn't say that people are born good and then get bad from there. God says we are born a mess and we sort of continue to be a mess. But that's one of the main stories or themes of the Bible. God taking people who are a mess and inspiring and enabling them to be better and better so that we can one day be the people he originally created us to be. One of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright, who has a totally cool British accent, so I love to hear him talk, well, he says that when Adam and Eve sinned, they stopped being fully human, and God has spent all this time trying to get us back to being fully human. But what does being fully human even mean? It means getting back to being God's good creation. It means doing things his way. Treating other people and the animals and the earth the way he wants them treated and not like, you know, acting like a snake in the garden. And you might protest, but what about Abraham? He was perfect. Oh, no way he sure wasn't. When he got too scared to trust God, he lied twice. And not only did he lie, but he lied in the exact same way both times. Oh, and he told his wife to lie too. And it got her into terrible trouble. And his son Isaac told the same lie years later. And Abraham and his wife Sarah weren't always patient in trusting with God and it caused their family terrible problems. What about Moses? Well, Moses had a temper, even if it did take a long time for him to show it. And when he lost his temper, he blamed it on the people who made him angry instead of taking the blame himself. And Moses made some allowances for bad behavior in the Torah that Jesus sure didn't agree with. There are reasons why Moses did that, and we'll talk to them when we come to it, but Moses wasn't perfect like Jesus. How about King David? King David did amazingly faithful things, but after he became king, he did things that were so evil and shameful that it resulted in a lot of death. The thing is, as Paul tells us too, we do terrible things that we know are wrong, and even when we know what's right, we don't do it. It can be really depressing. The Bible is a different kind of book. Now, most religious books won't dish dirt and make the big heroes of the faith look bad, but the Bible sure does. The Bible is honest that way. And it doesn't make any excuses. It just shows us what people did, and what people did is sometimes disgusting and shocking. But you can't read the Bible and come out thinking that we're all born as good people. Goodness, anyone with a baby brother or sister knows that that's not true. Babies are demanding right away, and as they grow up, they have to be taught about sharing and about personal property and personal space and about not hitting and biting and lying and hurting the pets. I'm going to tell you a funny story about one of my twins, Andrew. Andrew was a year old, and when I would tell him no, you know, not to do something, it was just obvious that he didn't understand yet. His twin brother understood, but Andrew didn't. But I kept saying no and taking him away from what he was doing that he shouldn't be doing. But one day he pulled himself up to standing on the kitchen drawers and was trying to open one up 
unsuccessfully. I told him no, and he was looking right at me when I said it, and I saw in his eyes that he understood exactly what no meant. But then, quick as you like, the look in his eye changed as though he had no idea, and I realized something important that day. That little dude had understood the word no for a long time, and he was playing me. I know because I saw in his eyes that he knew exactly what I was talking about, and then he pretended like he didn't understand. That one-year-old was lying to me! And I knew then and there that it's true that we are wicked from cradle to grave unless God does something to change it. Oh, that boy! And so, as we go through the Bible and learn about the different people and situations, we're going to have to face a lot of really unpleasant things, you know, maybe about people you may have been taught to think of as perfect. They had slaves, and they treated their slaves badly. They didn't see anything wrong with owning other human beings. They also didn't really think that loving their neighbors meant anything more than being good and loyal only to their own families or friends. We've talked about that before. But what about religious people who are following all the rules? Are they an exception to the rule that we're born a total mess? Well, Jesus and Paul both said no. I'm going to start with something that the Apostle Paul said in the letter to his friend Timothy. Now, you need to know some unpleasant things about Paul. Even though you might be a Christian because of him, if you're European, because other apostles went out preaching to Africa and Asia, he started out as an enemy to all the Jewish people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And in fact, because he thought it was what God wanted him to do, he went around arresting people. When the council got angry enough at Stephen to stone him to death, Paul held their cloaks. He was a witness, and after that is when he went out arresting people. Of course, God had his eye on Paul and wasn't ready to give up on him. So Jesus spoke to him and blinded him on one of his trips to go arrest people, and after that, Paul pretty much had to believe. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, Paul said, I give thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received this mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But this must also mean that Paul wasn't keeping God's commandments, right? Well, let's see what Paul had to say about that. This is from Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, and regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. And it might look here like Paul's bragging it, and maybe he is just a little bit. But the reason he's doing it is very important in order to better understand what Jesus also said. Paul wasn't out there arresting people because he was what anyone would call a sinful man. Actually, any of us would have looked at how religious he was and how well be he behaved himself and we would have been really impressed. His parents were Jewish and kept the commandments too. And he wasn't just all, nah, whatever about God. He loved God and wanted to serve God more than anything. He kept the Sabbath and wouldn't think of stealing or murdering anyone. Now, I'm sure he was very honest and virtuous, obeying all the rules that God gave people to keep them from being really awful to one another. And yet... Paul went out in the name of God, being hurtful and violent because 
He didn't understand. He really thought that what he was doing was good and righteous. But even though he was keeping the rules on the outside, the insides were still angry and violent and what we call being zealous for all the wrong reasons. Zealous is a word that we use when someone's very passionate, excited, and dedicated to believing in something and will do anything for it. Paul was that way about God, but he was still wrong even though he was sure he was right. Paul still had a lot to learn about God that he couldn't get from just following the rules, but God loved him and changed him into a man who was loving and peaceful. If you've read my curriculum book on uh, image-bearing idolatry and the new creation, then you know all about the kind of life that Paul told us was really required to please God. Yes, we keep his commandments, but if we aren't different on the inside, then there'll be trouble and we might find ourselves on the wrong side, thinking we are right, fighting against God instead of fighting for him. That's why Jesus said something kind of puzzling and a bit confusing. He knows everyone's hearts and what we're thinking about even when we aren't so sure ourselves. And Jesus said this right before talking about anger and insults being dangerous, and it sounds like he was talking to Paul. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Wow, how could anyone be more righteous than the Pharisees and scribes who lived and breathed and taught the Bible? Is there something wrong with the Bible? Well, no, of course not. But it can't change us on the inside, only on the outside. The Hebrew scriptures, all the stuff before Jesus that was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, a.k.a. Jesus' Bible, because everything else was written long after he died, they tell us to circumcise our own hearts. That means that we need to change our behavior to do and do what God wants. And we totally need to do things God's way. We can't love God and refuse to live like he wants us to, right? Imagine if we were out there killing people and lying and stealing and worse. Oh, I don't know what's worse than killing people. It's the commandments that are our first teachers about how to start behaving ourselves. Your grandparents or great-grandparents might say it this way. Straighten up and fly right. Stay in your own lane. Toe the line. Do the right thing. But then we get we look at the history of Israel and we see that outside only changes are really tough to stick with. One generation might be really good at it, but then their kids and grandkids are a mess again. Changing our hearts is not easy. In fact, without God's help, it's impossible. And that's not to say that God never helped people in those times, but you had to really want it. You had to really want more than to keep the rules because... We're wicked from birth, and very few people actually want that. Now, Jeremiah told us that a time was coming where God was going to step in and change our hearts for us. God wanted to make us righteous inside and outside, and only he could do it. We can't change our hearts any more than we can make a heart in the first place. Our hearts want to look out for us and not for everyone else. Our hearts want to do what's right for us, not for everyone else. Our hearts want to lie when we don't want to get into trouble. Our hearts want to hit until we start to care about hurting people, or care about hurting some people and not others. It's always been God's plan to make us good inside and outside. And don't get me wrong, if you want to kill someone, then definitely pretend like you don't want to kill them by not killing them. But God changes us slowly so that we stop wanting to kill and hit and lie and steal. I'll tell you the truth. Your parents probably wouldn't have wanted you to be in the same room with me 30 years ago, much less teaching you about anything. But God is changing me, and he'll change you too. If he could change Paul, who was traveling around arresting people, then just think of what he can do for you. (laughs) Anyway, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I hope you have a wonderful week studying the Bible with the people who love you.